He sees some British officers. He believes them to be Tarleton. He calls out a challenge, tears off after him, wanting to mano a mano duel with Tarleton. And there's this, this, this clash that happens. A handful of British cavalry officers, Washington, and one or two of his guys... And famously, there's this British officer who's coming in with a saber. He is about to hit Washington when a, a, a young waiter, is how it's first described, a young waiter who did not have strength to wield a sword, is described a few different ways by John Howard, a few other um, eyewitnesses. He pulls a pistol, fires it, wounds the British officer, saves Washington's life. You are listening to History Man, the platform for historians, curators, and authors to tell their stories of the American Revolution. Walk in the footsteps of heroes and proclaim freedom reigns. On today's episode, we are with William Caldwell, park ranger of the Over the Mountain Victory National Historic Trail and ranger for Cowpens. And uh, so tell me, how long after Kings Mountain did Cowpens occur? So we're looking at about a three month window here. Uh, Kings Mountain, October 7th, 1780, and then through that next winter to January 17th, 1781. Were there any battles in between? Yes, yeah, so you're looking at um, Kings Mountain really opens a can of worms for both sides. Um, you're looking at this challenging British supremacy in western South Carolina. Um, so this is a, an opportunity for a lot of Patriot partisans to step back up their efforts, especially Thomas Sumter. So one of the bigger fights you're going to see in November of 1780 is the Battle of Blackstock's Plantation. Uh, Thomas Sumter and roughly a thousand militia giving Bannister Tarleton of the British Army, the leader of the British Legion, uh, giving him a bit of a bloody nose there, even though Tarleton claimed victory because he had the battlefield. Uh, Sumter's men do escape that night in the darkness, although Sumter is wounded. You're looking at fighting over between militias in the, the Long Canes district. Um, this is going to be a big, significant fight um, not necessarily in numbers, but this is going to be one of those events that leads around to Andrew Pickens rejoining the, 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 the fight, taking the field again. He wasn't involved directly, but it's going to be these raids by um, Elijah Clark's Georgia militia into that area. Is going to uh, step up loyalist activity, trying to prevent and stop the Georgia Patriots. And in one of these raids, looking for Clark and his guys... Um, Andrew Pickens' farm is attacked. Now, Pickens had taken the oath of neutrality back in the summer of 1780. Um, the British had taken Charleston. They offered a, uh, a clean slate, full pardon to any militia who um, came back in, took the oath of neutrality, said they were sorry, and Pickens put it to a vote to his men. What did they want to do? Keep up the fight as rebel partisans or take the offer? And they voted for the offer. So he followed them, he gave his word, signed his name, he would not take up arms again. Um, all throughout the fall of 1780, you have both sides trying to court him and convince him to come back and join them, take the field. He is refusing, he gave his word. And then his home is attacked by some of this little militia raiding. And so he views his neutrality as being violated. So in his mind, giving him the permission that um, clean conscience to take back into the field. That's going to be in December. So he's going to then come back and find Daniel Morgan, uh, American General Daniel Morgan's army, offer his services and his men. You also have battles at uh, Hammond's store in December of 1780, a raid by um, American Continental Cavalry, William Washington, and some militia against more of these Georgia loyalists this time. Um, so a lot of swirling, smaller fights, we could call them, but there are directly connected to this big fight coming. So what were the cowpens? Let's, let's revisit that. They, they are cowpens, Eric. They are, that is literally, it is a, people ask, you know, what was here? Was this a significant crossroads? Was this a, you know, what, was there something here that they were fighting for? No, it's literally a cow field. Um, it is fairly open, described as open wood, part pasture with little to no growth in front. So scattered large trees, um, surrounded by swampy areas with cane breaks, a few creeks, um, these natural features that would kind of keep the cattle from wandering too far when you brought them through. It was located along a fairly well-used drover's path, a drover's road heading down towards the Spartanburg area. But it's just a well-known cow field in the middle of some swampy ground. How did Daniel Morgan get here? So Morgan, he's going to come back into the South. And something to keep in mind is that he's already... He's quit once. He's retired already. He was involved 
in the revolution since the beginning. He was at Boston. He was at Quebec. He's at Saratoga. He's fighting with light infantry um, in Jersey and you know, New York, Pennsylvania. But then when the new light infantry kind of brigade is formed in the Continental Army, he's being considered for that generalship. He is passed over and it's given to Anthony Wayne instead because it was a it was a political move. There were too many Virginia generals already. They needed somebody else, so they went with the Pennsylvanian. And Morgan says, fine, if that's how you're going to play it, I'm going home. So he retires, goes back to Winchester, Virginia. But then you have the war in the South really heats up. You have Charleston. You have General Gates is sent south by Congress to take command of this replacement Southern Army. Gates swings by Morgan's home, meets with him, and he convinces him. He gets permission to give him that General's Commission, a Brigadier General. He says, look, I got this for you. Come be with me. Help me. They've served together up in the Saratoga campaign. And so Morgan agrees. He puts some of his, his, his brain trust together, some of his best guys that have been with him the whole war. And they start making their way down to help the Southern Army. They miss Camden. They, um, they miss Kings Mountain. Um, but they arrive there in October, November. And Morgan's back in the field. Uh, so his big mission at this point is he's been detached from the main Continental Army. Uh, General Nathaniel Green is in command in the South now, replacing Gates after Gates' defeat at Camden. And Morgan's kind of mission is to have this elite force of some of the best trained Continental soldiers, guys from the Maryland and Delaware lines. Um, he has this small force, some Virginia Continental Cavalry. He has them in the western part of South Carolina, while General Green and the other little more than a half of the Continental Army are going to be over to the east in what's now the area around Chira, South Carolina. Green's idea here is that by splitting the army in two very distinct regions of the state, it will be easier not only to feed them, because they, they have to feed less men than if they were all combined together, but also kind of distract Cornwallis. Uh, Lord Cornwallis from his winter quarters in Winsboro, he's watching these two forces move around kind of his left and his right side. If he goes for Green to the right, that leaves his left flank open to Morgan, who could attack 96. If he goes for Morgan on the left flank, that leaves his right side open for Green to come down towards Camden. So Green's idea is by staging these two roughly within reach, Cornwallis will kind of be frozen with indecision and buy enough time for the American army to be pieced back together, rebuilt, resupplied, reclothed. Green is trying to build an army out of the fragments he's inherited. How did we end up at Calpiums again? So Daniel Morgan, he is, when he's out here in South Carolina, um, his impact is not so much material as it is mental. Uh, he is showing the people that there is still hope, that the American cause is still alive. Here are some Continental soldiers. He's able to coordinate some of the militia actions in the area, just kind of keeping touch with all these different partisans who are now operating. Is this um, his headquarters? It is not. So he's actually at Grindle Shoals on the Packlet River, well-known river crossing, easy to find by all the locals. That's where he's going to be. Where is that today? Just outside Spartanburg, South Carolina. Not, not too far from Cowpens, actually, just south of us a while. But it's from this headquarters that he is sending out guys like William Washington and his cavalry to go attack the Loyalists at Hammond's store. Um, he is encouraging more patriot activity. And when the British see this movement, especially see Washington's raids, William Washington's raids, they think Morgan might make a push on Fort 96 and capture that key western town. So that gets the British concerned. They send one of their most aggressive young officers, Bannister Tarleton, to either drive Morgan out of the district or catch and defeat him. Either way, get him away from western South Carolina. So when Tarleton begins chasing after Morgan, Morgan begins cautiously falling back, and he falls back and finds this cow field. So how many Continentals were involved as opposed to militia at this point? Not many. You're looking at Morgan's army with him, um, the actual Continentals. There's three companies of Maryland troops, one company of Delaware. Grand total, maybe 290, um, less than 300. And then you have Continental Cavalry, the third Continental Light Dragoons with William Washington, only about, about 80 of those guys. So a very small force. Now he is joined by some experienced militia, especially Virginia militia, state militia who have been sent south by their governor. Uh, some of these guys are former Continentals. They had served earlier in the war when the terms were much shorter. 
and so they have that experience some of that training but they are technically a militia but they are professional enough that morgan uses them like continentals in the coming battle how many militia that's that's the question morgan himself does not know the official report that he sends to congress after the fight it records a grand total of 970 men under his command that is the information that you will see at cowpens national battlefield on the large 1932 u.s monument out front of the visitor center but if you look at the numbers and the names you start to notice he's leaving guys off the list they're not there uh, and then you compare this to Bannister Tarleton, his memoirs after the war. At one point in the battle, he says he topped over a ridge and saw 1,000 militia, just militia, 1,000 strong. So it's really trying to sort through the other descriptions, the other pension applications, some of the great work done by Dr. Bobby Moss about some of these participants. We believe that Morgan's army grand total may have been... 12, 1300 militia coming in anywhere from 16 to 1800 strong. Some estimates go as high as 2000 total. Just the, the fluid nature of the militia. They joined up the evening before the battle. They left after the battle was done that next morning. Um, they didn't stick around really to get, get counted. So it's, it's a bit of a question for how many militia. Well, while you're talking, I'm remi reminded of the previous episode about Kings Mountain, how you said as they came further south, that people would just come in in twos and dozens and just kind of add to the ranks of the closer they got to Ferguson. Right, and this is a problem that's going to plague the British when Tarleton is trying to find out what can he expect from Morgan because Daniel Morgan, he knows the militia won't stay in camp. He, he They are wanting to go home. He can't blame them. They are not staying. They are coming and drawing rations, and then they're just leaving again. So rather than try and control this, this mob of men, he just has them stay nearby um, and just keep in communication with him. So you have some loyalist spies come back to Tarleton and say, oh, Morgan is down the road with 800 men. That's how many they have seen in his actual camp, the Continentals, the state militia. But then other loyalist scouts know all of the other groups who are nearby who are kind of part of Morgan's spider web. And they say, no, there's two, three thousand men under Morgan. So now Tarleton doesn't know who to believe. I've got one guy saying 800, one guy saying 3,000. I don't know what to believe going into the battle. Some militiamen talk about they arrived here the morning the battle was happening and took part in the aftermath. Some guys say they got here as the battle was ending and just helped guard the uh, escort the prisoners and help with the wounded. You've got some militia, one guy in particular, he was just coming by himself and walked up on a camp in the night, was mistaken for a loyalist and shot and killed. And so his, his family is actually going to file a pension application for him saying he was there trying to help and he was killed by his own guys. Mm -hmm. So a lot of different stories about the militia numbers being very fluid. I would think the British numbers, at least through the reports, would probably be a little more spot on. Uh, how many did they bring to the fight? So a little more spot on. The question then becomes when, like, who do you consider? Because you have around eleven to 1,200 is the numbers under Bannister Tarl. This is debating if you count about 100 to 150 men left behind as a baggage guard. About a mile and a half down the road, there were um, at least 35 supply wagons traveling with Tarleton's army. This also depends if you count 50 scouts and spies that Tarleton had as his kind of information network that were not involved in the fight, but they were in the rear with his army. They took part in some of the aftermath and this being pursued, but they weren't in the fight itself. So roughly 11 to 1,200. So you talked about black stocks earlier, black stocks being where Thomas Sumter at the end of the battle, he was shot and uh, incapacitated or laid up, and it was, he was out of the fight for a few months. He certainly didn't make it to this fight. But some of his men did, correct? And that's, yeah, so that's one of the interesting things. Again, not only are militia fluid as far as coming and going, but who they serve under. Um, it's interesting, some of the officers that you will see listed as serving under James Williams, uh, Edward Lacey, William Hill, uh, some of these groups are now serving under other officers by this point. Uh, Sumter, like you said, he's still recovering from being shot through the shoulders at Blackstock's. There's a few times that Morgan tries to coordinate with Sumter's men directly, sending out officers to gather supplies and men, and they meet with failure, huge failure. One officer in particular, Morgan sends out, and he comes back with nothing, no men, no food, nothing. 
and Morgan asks him, what, what happened? Where, where is my help? And the officer has to report to Morgan that Sumter is telling all of his subordinates to not assist Morgan unless Sumter tells him to, unless it is coming from Sumter. Sumter is getting very territorial because he is, he, he feels he's being passed over that Morgan is this, this new hotshot general down here trying to command things and take over when Sumter has been the one with a general's commission in the South Carolina militia. He's been the one holding the line for so long, and rather than these guys coming down and helping him, they're coming down and calling the shots, and he's supposed to just fall into line under them. He, he's not having it. So not a lot of cooperation from Sumter directly, but a lot of the militia who are close enough to the border area, uh, to uh, Andrew Pickens's jurisdiction, they're coming up here under Pickens. Colonels Roebuck, Brandon, John Thomas Jr., Joseph Hayes. Uh, so uh, some really big militia leading figures who were at Kings Mountain under Williams. Um, they're going to be here now under Pickens. I'm going to go down a rabbit hole right right quick, and you've kind of spurred this in the back of my mind. What's your viewpoint on Sumter? You said territorial. He feels like he's being passed over, that sort of thing. Is that a fair assessment of what was going on, or do you think he was on the up and up? What, what's your viewpoint of Sumter? I think he was very focused on the problem in front of him. This is a man who, for a long time, was the only line in the sand. He was the only line of defense between his home, his men's homes, and British victory. And even when they had to flee, even when they had, were driven into North Carolina, he kept them together. He kept the fight going. And, and he's seen service all over the war. He's been at the defense of Charleston. He was on the Cherokee campaign in 76. He's, he's been in combat. He knows what good and bad officers look like. So I think potentially he has seen enough bad decisions made that he's extremely cautious to risk his home and his men's homes in the hands of someone that he doesn't know and trust. This is it's kind of reflected in the letter from General Nathaniel Green. He's, Sumter is very big on being in command and doing his own thing, but Green writes to him saying that, you know, while you're doing is great, you have to follow my command. The letter says that, you know, partisan strokes are like the garnish on a dinner table. They bring splendor to the officers and the army, but nothing substantial in national security. And then in another letter, he explains to him that Sumter's men, you know, two of Sumter's men are worth 10 North Carolina militia because these men are fighting for their homes. Green goes on to kind of you know, flatter and explain to Sumter and support him saying, you know, if the North Carolinians fail or if they retreat, that's fine. They go home. But if your South Carolina militia fail, they lose everything. So I think there's a lot of added pressure there that's making Sumter very cautious from helping out. So not, not quite a team player. Maybe doesn't have the best the best motives. You're looking at trying to lead himself and get some more glory, but um, he's also got some some really good reasons. He's seen some really bad calls made, so potentially he he's got a little more reason than people give him credit to for for not being a not being a team player. So Cornwallis is in Winsboro, and Tarleton is where. So Cornwallis, yeah, the headquarters have been in Winsboro. Um, he's started to move north along the Broad River. Kind of the idea that he and Tarleton come up with is Tarleton has been dispatched out towards uh, towards 96. He's picked up some reinforcements on the way who were heading towards 96 or guarding different river crossings, Briarley's Ford especially. And he has started to push north from 96, kind of directly north towards Cowpens. And while he's doing that, Lord Cornwallis is pushing north along the Broad River with the idea of if Morgan flees to the east, flees away from Tarleton, he'll flee into Cornwallis's army. Um, the plan is for them to kind of, like a giant pincer movement, converge in the area of Kings Mountain, the area just west of Charlotte, and hopefully catch Morgan between the two of them, or at least drive them out of the state. Well, how did the recruiting take place to get the men to Calpins? Not great at first. So with Morgan's headquarters being on the Packlet River, he, he knows the area, and again, what Morgan realizes is... These guys are not going to stay together, but they do need to be in communication. So when Morgan does begin falling back, Pickens has shown up in camp just a couple weeks before. This big charismatic figure, the, the fighting elder, the wizard owl, this leading militia officer has brought a lot of not just numbers, but kind of clout, kind of respectability, street cred to Morgan's army. 
And Daniel Morgan himself is a living legend. This guy is already a celebrity before this battle. In fact, when the King's Mountain guys were making their way down to that battle, they know Morgan is either arrived or soon to arrive. They write to General Gates asking Morgan to be assigned to lead them. They want Morgan in charge. This guy's a big hero. Um, and Morgan's aware of that. He knows his reputation and he plays it up. He plays his character perfectly, even when his health is just falling apart. So he begins falling back from Tarleton's army. And there's a militia account that talks about this, that when they're retreating, they feel like they're running from Tarleton. And they are, they are discouraged. They are angry. They are openly cursing the general, he says. But then when they realize that he's just falling back to a good place to fight, it, it's, it's a 180. It's a huge spirit boost. They, they cheer the general. They are ready to go. Um, so when the news goes out that we are not on the run again, like they've seen all the past year, they're just going to a better spot to fight. Word spreads like wildfire. So you have messengers, couriers, all these local patriot groups that were in the area but not quite with Morgan's army. They get word. Pickens' guys spread the word and they pour into Morgan's campsite there at the cow pen the night before the battle. So whose idea was it to fight? Was it Morgan's? No. Was it Pickens? <laughs> it was Tarleton. Um Tarleton is determined to catch this guy and take him out of the fight one way or another. In fact, when Daniel Morgan is first out here, one of his letters from Green, it kind of weighs out the weight of his mission. He's like, under no conditions, risk a fight. Like, don't risk losing these guys. This, the, the best part of the Continentals in the South. If Morgan loses these guys, another Patriot defeat with their most elite veterans, there is no coming back from that. There is no picking up the pieces. The pieces will be gone. In fact, when Morgan is retreating and he's hearing all the grumblings and complaints, he writes to Green saying that I have to fight somewhere in South Carolina because if I go into North Carolina, the South Carolinians are going to view it as game over and they're going to not support us anymore. They'll, they're going to leave the army. They're not going to follow a, 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 a coward, a loser. They're not going to retreat anymore. So he knows he's got to do something, uh, but he would really prefer not to risk it. But the day before the battle, he knows Tarleton's closing in. Tarleton is pushing his men so hard. He is chasing in Morgan's pickets from the day before. Morgan knows he needs to pick a site somewhere soon. And then he sees the cow pen. There's a local militia officer named Dennis Trammell who gives Morgan a bit of a tour. It's kind of the... The, the first park tour at Cal Penn's National Battlefield. And he shows him the features of the ground, the hills, the swamps, the ridges. And Trammell records this in his pension application. He says the general turned to him and, this, and said that this field will hold victory or my bones. So you can take that as this encouraging, this is it, this is my, this is my Waterloo, this is my San Jacinto, this is where the ground I want to fight on. Or you can take it kind of resigned as like, well... This is the only spot I can find. This is what I have to make do with. This is it. But Morgan, if he had his qualms, he actually would not be here. He, a few times before, has written to Green and said, Look, I can do nothing substantial here. Let me go to Georgia. There are more partisans there. I can support them there. Let me come back to the army. He says, I don't have enough men to really do anything significant by myself out here in western South Carolina. I'm only making these people a bigger target for British attacks by my being here. So let me leave. Let me go somewhere else. But again, Green needs Morgan close, but not too close. Far, but not too far. And so he wants Morgan to stay there in Upper South Carolina. Uh, so Morgan's kind of backed into a corner. So who are some of the individuals in, in their stories from this battle? Talk to me some, of them, some about that. Well, so, I mean, you're looking at... Um, one of my favorite stories is William... I mean, that's one of the big things about Morgan is uh, when you, if you come visit Cal Penn's National Battlefield today in the uh, visitor center, we have a series of portraits over the information desk. And surprisingly, Morgan is not in the middle. Um, you have all of Morgan's officers arrayed in an arc with Andrew Pickens, William Washington, John Eager Howard. Um, these guys form an amazing leadership team and that's what Morgan has done here. He has put guys in command who know their job, their capabilities, and their downfalls. They know their weaknesses and their strengths so thoroughly that they're able to coordinate with each other 
and not make a poor decision, able to help each other. So like, for example, William Washington, the cavalry officer, ex experienced soldier, he has risen through the ranks to become lieutenant colonel of the 3rd Continental Light Dragoons. He has fought against Tarleton personally several times in the fighting around the Low Country uh, in the, during the siege of Charleston. It was Bannister Tarleton and his cavalry trying to cut the American lines, and it was Washington and his cavalry trying to keep them open. So places like Leonard's Ferry, Monk's Corner, uh, Middleton's Plantation, Tarleton usually gets the, the better of Washington and his guys. A few times Washington and his men have had to jump into the rivers and the swamps and swim to safety just to escape Tarleton's horsemen. But because of this, Washington knows how Tarleton fights and thinks, and so he kind of can help tell Morgan what to expect. John Eager Howard, he is, I think he's 28 years old at this battle. He's in command of the Continentals under Morgan. This, you know, young aristocratic kid from Baltimore, very wealthy family in the Baltimore area. There's a story I came across where he actually got into a, a fight at Valley Forge on the parade ground in front of the commander-in-chief. He and this other artillery officer, they just start with a few little smart aleck comments. Words get exchanged, pistols get pulled. They're on the parade ground. So that's just kind of the, this kind of scrapper kind of spirit that John Howard has. And then you've, you've got just Andrew Pickens, you know, this big militia leader, this, this community leader, this church leader from the Long Canes district. His experience in fighting loyalist militia, the Cherokee Nation, British regulars a few times, he knows how to command men. Um, and him being here is a huge draw for the local militia. So that's, I mean, that's just the, uh, some of the officers under Morgan, but each one of these guys brings an amazing story with them. Any women? We had women at, uh, at Kings Mountain. Did we have any women here at, uh, Cowpans? So there are no documented women involved with the armies. Uh, when Tarleton realizes that he's going to be chasing after Morgan on this kind of breakneck pace, um, one of his orders is he's going to leave baggage and women at Fort 96 before pushing north. So usually with the regular forces, you would see one of the soldiers' wives for every, uh, and the ratio varied, um, sometimes one wife to every six men, seven, eight, ten. Um, they were allowed, they were actually requested to come with the army to serve as laundresses, as nurses. And you're looking at disease killing far more American soldiers than British bullets ever did and clean clothes was essential to soldiers' health. So laundry is gonna be a cr crucial aspect of why you would have women with the army. So Tarleton says baggage and women to be left behind. So likely none of those followers were allowed to come with his army. We don't have any records for if the women of the Maryland and Delaware Continentals were allowed to come with them. However, they have been on detached service out here with Morgan for almost a month, for a long time. So I personally believe that there were likely women who, were, who came with them. I haven't found any records for that yet. That's one of my little research quests, is to hopefully eventually find some kind of reference, some kind of documentation to prove that you have Continental Army laundresses here with Morgan's Flying Army. How about teenagers or children or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, same thing you're going to find with any kind of fighting when you have militia involved. You're going to have participants. I mean, the, the legal fighting age was 16, but you're going to have some guys who are younger than that. James Collins, who was 15 at Kings Mountain, he is now 16 here at Cowpens. Thomas Young, who was 16 at Kings Mountain, is actually fighting on his birthday, the day of the battle, January 17th. He turned 17 years old, uh, so he's going to be out here fighting. And because these guys were so young at the time of the fight, when you do have the pension application acts go out, uh, the kind of the big open door policies by Congress in 1823, they are young enough to still remember a lot of the details. So they give some of the best described pictures of how this fight happened. Well, that leads us to Native Americans and African Americans and any other group that, that might be out there. Yeah, so it's interesting. The um, the only documented Native American participant in this battle, his name is Thomas Tyak. He's a Piscataway from the, the Maryland coastal area. He's actually with the British Legion. He is with the infantry who are serving under Tarleton, the, the green-jacketed American loyalists. But he's a former Continental. So he is one of these great stories we have of a Continental soldier who had joined the Maryland line, served as a musician, he had been captured at, um, I want to say it was the Battle of Camden, where he is captured. And then he's given the offer, stay in British prison ships or join the British Legion. And he joined. 
Um, he's with the uh, British infantry at the Battle of Cowpens. He is captured by his old unit and is allowed to rejoin them and serve alongside them the rest of the war. So he is not only the you know a great story by Native American participants, but also this situation that some of these guys were in. Do I want to join the British Legion, join these uh, these provincial regiments or stay in a British prison ship. As far as the African-American participants, there, there are several that are recorded. There's a few that are more myth than, than uh, truth. But one of the known documented men was uh, Dick Pickens, um, enslaved to Andrew Pickens, who was famously said to have you know, assisted Andrew Pickens throughout the entire war, every campaign, every battle. Dick Pickens was there with him. The story goes that he was allowed to carry this this large kind of like a like a hunting knife on his belt at wherever he went, and he almost had his kind of unofficial authority um, because he was the enslaved man of Andrew Pickens and had seen so many campaigns. He kind of had this kind of respect that he carried with him. And as far as African Americans go, there's this one story you have in the British supply wagons a mile and a half down the road. You have seventy African Americans there who are actually captured by uh, patriots, patriot militia and cavalry in the aftermath of the battle. Not a lot is known about these people. We know that they were with the British column. We do not know if they were enslaved or if they had taken the opportunity of the British forces coming through their region to, to self-emancipate and to regain their freedom by joining the British line. Um, you're looking at this being after the 1779 Phillipsburg Proclamation where Sir Henry Clinton has said you know, any person enslaved by the Patriots will have their freedom if they reach British lines. So potentially these 70 people have taken this chance to follow with Tarleton and help how they can and claim their freedom there. Um, but of those 70, we only know the names of only, only eight of those 70. Billy, Bob, Jem, Jenny, Nanny, Primus, Sarah, and Will. And the only reason we know their names is because they were actually captured by the Patriots, viewed as property, and kind of dished out, doled out to American officers to use their service in lieu of back pay. And they were to, to, to keep them and hold them in slavery until the Continental Congress could decide what to do with them. Who decided that? Um, so the papers we have are coming from Andrew Pickens, being the, the leader of the militia. Um, it's in his re his records, his some of his writings. So there's a great big them. controversy that uh, Thomas Sumter did the same thing, and it was frowned upon. And and uh, but we have Andrew Pickens doing the same thing. Well, that's that's where you get those those hairs being split. Pickens was saying here, until we know what to do, until we can sort this out, go ahead and take these people and use their use their service as payment until we figure it out. And um, that's why they made such a big deal about the records is so that they could then follow back up with them later. Primus was, uh, there was a Primus at uh, Kings Mountain too? It, it, yeah, but it's one of those names that it was likely uh, likely a, 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 an enslaved name. Um, it wasn't his actual name. Okay. It's going to be one of these, these names um, you see. Not the same guy though? Probably not. You see a lot of things like Scipio, Primus, Caesar, things that kind of harken back to antiquity, Greco-Roman influences that you see these enslaved men especially being given these names by their enslavers. And not terribly imaginative. So you see a lot of repetition. So one of the most famous African-American uh, heroes in this story is actually William Washington's body servant, yes? So that's that's one of those ones that's more myth than reality. Okay. There was a recent study done because, yeah, we, what you're looking at, there are several accounts that talk about the scene at the end of the Battle of Cowpens. William Washington, American cavalry officer, is behind the British army with his men. They've been circled around at the end of the battle. He sees some British officers. He believes them to be Tarleton. He calls out a challenge, tears off after him, wanting to mano a mano, duel with Tarleton. And there's this, this, this clash that happens. A handful of British cavalry officers, Washington, and one or two of his guys. And famously, there's this British officer who's coming in with a saber. He is about to hit Washington when a, a, a young waiter, is how it's first described, a young waiter who did not have strength to wield a sword is described a few different ways by John Howard, a few other um, eyewitnesses. He pulls a pistol, fires it, wounds the British officer, saves Washington's life. 
They don't mention his race anywhere. What you have is descriptions as being a, a, a waiter, a bugler, a servant, a you know things like that. So in the 1840s and 50s, when you have William, uh, William Rainey paints this famous scene, he paints this picture of these cavalry clashing um, through an 1840s South Carolina perspective, you're hearing these descriptions of a young boy, servant, waiter. Okay, he's likely going to be an enslaved African-American boy. So that's how he paints him. But more of the research has said, no, it is pr probably was a white bugler, a trumpeter, that was on Washington's staff. That's why he doesn't have a sword. That's why he just has his pistol instead. That's why he's right there by Washington's side, so he can relay these commands. We believe his name to be William Collins. See, that's only just kind of really kind of been confirmed over the last couple years. I'm kind of digging more into those primary sources, those eyewitnesses who don't think to mention it, but just the way they describe them in different ways, uh, c comparing that to different service records of the Third Continental Light Dragoons, the most likely person who that was was William Collins, a white bugler. Well, now, that's interesting. It is. It's one of those great stories of public history because and how it changes iconically, over the, years. the iconic painting of Calpins is the black manservant pulling a pistol on the British Dragoon to mm -hmm. save Washington. Isn't that interesting? And that's one of the big problems that you look at when you have sources, either visual or written descriptions from the 19th century, is you often will run into these times where they're trying to use stories of the faithful, loyal, enslaved man to kind of highlight this, this narrative of, well, you see how attached they were to their enslaver. You see how loyal they were. It's like, this is not... You know, this is coming from a slave economy, a slave system. It's like, well, let's look back at the actual eyewitness documents. That's not quite what was happening. So it's a very interesting study in public history. It's my favorite thing to talk about with, like, college-level public history. That's an interesting twist. Course. I mean, it really it is. It is, yeah. Uh, it's funny because you have that story, and on the other hand, you have Bannister Tarleton, whose whole family comes from a major slave, uh, slave trade, slaving family in Liverpool, um, there was even a slave ship called the Tarleton that his family owned. But yeah, there's a lot of interesting little ways to follow that. Well, wow. What are some events that are happening here at the park? Uh, so, well, um, like we've talked about, we've got a great battlefield trail at Cowpens National Battlefield. You can walk through the field, interpretive signs, explain the battle. Um, and then the, the January 17th battle is always commemorated on the weekend closest. Um, so you can find out more about that, www.nps.gov slash C-O-W-P. Um, and you can find a list of events on there. We're also on social media, things like Facebook and Instagram. Uh, there's all kinds of events here throughout the year as well. Well, thank you so much, William. Of course. Appreciate it.